Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Welcome to this talk sponsored by the Institute of World Politics. Uh, for those of you that are new here, welcome. IWP is a graduate school of national security, intelligence, and international affairs. We offer a doctoral program, seven master's degree programs, including two that are online, and 18 certificates of graduate study. If you are at all interested in learning more about us, please feel free to grab a staff member after the conclusion of the event or visit us at iwp.edu. To support the work of IWP, please feel free to visit iwp.edu backslash donate. Before we begin the lecture, we ask that you take a moment to silence all electronic devices. So I'll give you guys a second here. While we listen to the bells in the background. Thank you. Today we'll be hearing from Dr. Adrian Zenz, who will deliver a lecture entitled Communism in China and the Oppression of Ethnic Minorities. Dr. Adrian Zenz is a senior fellow and director in China studies at the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation in Washington, DC. He obtained his PhD in social anthropology from the University of Cambridge and has conducted ethnographic fieldwork in Western China. Dr. Zenz has provided expert testimony to the governments of Germany, France, the United Kingdom, Canada, and the United States. And after the publication of his research on forced labor and cotton picking, the US government banned the import of goods made with cotton from Xinjiang. Following his research on population optimization and birth prevention, an independent tribunal in the United Kingdom determined that China's policies in the region constitute genocide. Dr. Zenz's work on parent-child separation in Xinjiang prompted The Economist to feature this atrocity on its cover page and to refer to it as, quote, a crime against humanity that represents, quote, the gravest example of a worldwide attack on human rights. His research focuses on China's ethnic policy, Beijing's campaign of mass internment, securitization and forced labor in Xinjiang, public recruitment and coercive, uh, excuse me, coercive poverty alleviation in Tibet and Xinjiang, and China's domestic security budgets. Dr. Zenz is the author of Tibetanists Under Threat and co-editor of Mapping, Mapping Omdo, Dynamics of Change. He has played a leading role in the analysis of leaked Chinese government documents, including China Cables, Karakok's List, and the Xinjiang Papers. Dr. Zenz is also an advisor to the Interparliamentary Interparliamentary Alliance on China and a frequent contributor to international media. With that, please welcome Dr. Adrian Zenz. Thank you very much for having me here today. It's my pleasure and privilege to be speaking in my first time at the Institute of World Politics. I already got the tour of this historic house in its illustrious history in many respects. Um, I wonder if the Soviets still have microphones here. Maybe they sold them to Beijing, you know. The Chinese are now in charge. But um, anyways, it's my real pleasure to be here and I will be speaking on the topic of the communist rule and the oppression of ethnic minorities in China. To give you a little overview, I'll be taking you very briefly through some of the historic aspects from Mao Zedong to Xi Jinping, looking at evolution of Beijing's ethnic policy and the ultimate failure of this policy, culminating in riots and repressions, and then how some of these repressive policies have been culminating under the current president, um, or rather General Secretary Xi Jinping. Uh, with a particular focus, of course, on the repressive policies in Xinjiang among the Uyghurs, which is one of the main focuses of my research. So if we look at how some of this started, it's, it's always important to keep in mind what is the ultimate goal, what is the ultimate aim here. And I think also if we try to understand what the Chinese Communist Party has been doing um, in among its ethnic minorities, but also the Han majority, it's important to keep in mind what is the ultimate goal? What is really the aim they're driving at, which is really not that different, of course, from other organizations. Um, it is self-preservation. Um, but one of the special features, and of course we see some elements of that we have seen with you know, Stalin, with some of the Soviet uh, rule, is the amount of internal paranoia driven by existential fears that is behind a lot of these dynamics of how to achieve the goal of self-preservation because the CCP knows what happens if it ever should no longer be in power. 
it'd be prosecuted, it, it'd, be, it'd be in big trouble. And so loss of power is the greatest fear. So we have to understand the motivation also for the human rights abuses and the situation among ethnic uh, groups in Western China is very much driven by this existential fear of loss of power and control. We know that Mao Zedong in the 1950s, of course, heavily driven by ideology and existential concerns and paranoid uh, preoccupations at the time. For example, this drove him to seek to catch up with the countries that he sort of feared or respected or looked up to England and the United States uh, by pursuing the great leap forward, melting, literally melting, getting the whole, mobilizing the whole population to melt their iron, for example, to increase iron production, but then people had no longer cooking pots. But, but the, the, the strategy of mobilizing an entire population to do something is very much what characterizes Chinese policy, uh, both among their own people, but also among ethnic groups. And it's always very important to keep that in mind. It's one of the basic uh, organizing principles. And Deng Xiaoping, we saw a person who was exercising a degree of wisdom, a degree of restraint. He pursued a policy of moderation after disasters of the Great Leap Forward, the Cultural Revolution. He said that the country needed to develop its production base. So he allowed very, very, very smartly in many ways a degree of cultural and religious freedoms. But there's one problem that happened. So his compromise solution invited capitalist market principles into China. It allowed a certain degree of freedom of individual religious pursuit. Both of these led to developments beyond the control of the party that would ultimately potentially threaten its existence. We've all heard about, of course, the fall of the Soviet Union and the fall of other regimes happens because these regimes ideologically become bankrupt. There's really nothing to it. There's no substance. There's, uh, in, 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 in the Soviet case, there's no economic substance. There's no ideological substance. The people didn't want it. In the Chinese case, the Communist Party very smartly prevented what happened to the Soviet Union in part by permitting individuals to pursue their own wealth, their own goals, their own business goals within the limited, of course, freedoms afforded by the Communist Party back then. Even so, it, within this space, there was a great hunger left by the Cultural Revolution, by the destruction and the spiritual destruction of the Cultural Revolution and those times left a big vacuum, a hunger for meaning, for purpose, for something. And in this vacuum, filling this vacuum was not the Chinese Communist Party successfully, no. Rather, it was a whole host of both indigenous and external spiritual movements and religions. Huge success of movements including Christianity, of course, with house churches, Buddhism, even Han Chinese uh, developing a great fascination, not just with Chinese Buddhism, but also Tibetan Buddhism. And of course, the Falun Gong. Falun Gong seen as a major threat by the Chinese. And the problem is, the, the Communist Party itself was becoming internally more and more bankrupt, more and more corrupt. The wealth was driving a moral and a spiritual corruption within the party inequalities in society and an increasing detachment of the party from the population. And this created a context where subsequent, this was now under Jiang Zemin and then Hu Jintao, and this explains so much of the actions today that we see under the regime of Xi Jinping. The ideological threat to see what does the Communist Party still have to offer? China did not need a Communist Party to develop uh, at that time. So the reassertion of ideology that we see under Xi Jinping is very much rooted in this threat. And I'll talk more about that in a second. But let's see how this fared among the ethnic groups, for example. So the CCP policy failure in the 2000s was evident among its own Han majority population, 
but it was even more evident amongst the ethnic minorities. We had in 2008 the Lhasa riots and 2009 the Urumqi riots, both you know, sparked by certain incidents, but the main, the main takeaway is that in Lhasa, the Tibetans, in Urumqi, the Uyghurs, they were writing against the Han because they felt that despite economic growth and limited freedoms, that the economic development policies mostly benefited the Han. There was a lot of Han Chinese in migration in those regions. They were in many ways starting to become the minority in regions where they used to be the majority. And cultural disenfranchisement. The problem is that, of course, the, the, the Communist Party expected that as these regions were becoming more prosperous and, and wealthy on the whole, and some of these benefits were trickling down to the, the minorities, the Tibetans and the Uyghurs, that they would abandon some of their spiritual pursuits and identities and be happy to be part of the People's Republic of China. But the ethnic groups were seeking greater cultural autonomy or even independence. But even if they did not seek independence, they were looking for genuine cultural autonomy. But that is the very thing that they did not get because after Deng Xiaoping, successive Chinese presidents, um, and in particular starting with Hu Jintao, were starting to shrink the realm. Now, <clears throat> the Chinese government realized that its ethnic policy had failed. Despite improved infrastructure, increasing incomes in general in ethnic regions, the ethnic minorities were rising up against the Chinese. This was a shock to them, and they realized that something hadn't worked out. Then along came the man who is not a man of half-hearted measures, President Xi Jinping in 2012. So, among the Han population, the CCP strategy of growing economic development, of technological advancement, of promoting national pride, uh, even raw nationalism, had been a success among the Han majority. It was very successful. The Han said, you know, our country is getting more powerful, our country is getting more technologically advanced, everything is going well. But the ethnic minorities did not think the same way. So Xi Jinping's strategy was to continue to, well, compared to Hu Jintao, he projected the image of a strong man, the image of a strong leader. Hu Jintao was a bit more uh, inclined to compromise, to discuss, to hold different factions of the Communist Party in power, and to, um, to try not to take too drastic measures. Xi Jinping, however, stoked nationalism, stoked expansionism, became more aggressive outwardly, also a more aggressive foreign policy, and then things really came to a head <clears throat> over the region of Xinjiang. Now, in this map, we just have a little map here. You can see we have the Tibetan region, we have Xinjiang, where the Uyghurs live. And this takes up really quite a substantial amount of um, space in the region, as you can tell. It's quite a substantial amount of the area, of the land area, Xinjiang became a particular focus because in 2012 and 13, Xi Jinping announced his signature goal of the Belt and Road Initiative. And the Belt and Road Initiative was to build a sea bridge and a land bridge of trade, kind of tracing back the ancient Silk Road. And if you look at the map, Xinjiang occupies, that's the staging post for the Belt and Road Initiative into Central Asia, trains running to Europe, trade with, the, with Russia, and here into Iran in the Middle East and Pakistan. Pakistan being a key ally and then to the port in the Indian Ocean. Now there's 11 to 12 million Uyghurs in Xinjiang. And the initial strategy in both Tibet and Xinjiang was basically the same. A reliance on increased police state tactics, recruiting, mass recruiting of police forces, introduction of comprehensive surveillance systems, whole, sorry, there's a typo, whole city security systems. You know, Huawei and other companies, Chinese companies, they have a citywide security system whereby you have a hard drive capacity of petabytes, not terabytes, not gigabytes, not terabytes, but petabytes, and it can record live stream 
video footage for a city-wide surveillance system. You can blanket a city with thousands of security cameras. Of course, we do some of that in the West too. But here the purpose is quite different. And if you compare, this is kind of, this is the first research that um, got of mine, of my own, that got published by the media and that where this kind of started my research on Xinjiang was to look at police recruitment. And here we had actually quite, uh, quite low per capita figures of uh, police recruitment. I think these are per 100,000. And with the Urumqi riots, you had an initial increase. And then uh, when Xi Jinping came into power, you had another increase. But then Xi Jinping and other officials declared a war on terror, uh, trying to mirror the American war on terror. And then under a party secretary called Chen Quanguo, Xinjiang became the world's foremost police state with the probably highest per capita of police in the world, even surpassing the East German Republic. East Germany, under communism, previously had one of the highest ratio of police and security forces per regular population. And here we see uh, you know, the staging of uh, armed police forces to scare the population or the introduction of almost paramilitary vehicles, so the People's Armed Police Forces uh, were trying to bridge sort of the, the space between the military and the regular police. It's a very heavily armed police that uh, came to be uh, very strongly deployed, and very prominent also on the streets in Xinjiang. High-tech surveillance, the so-called Skynet, whereby in real time you can scan number plates, uh, facial recognition, matching it with databases, uh, seeing everybody's whereabouts. So the cameras themselves have facial recognition cap capabilities built into the camera. The, uh, it doesn't have to be just on the computer end. And as you can tell, this was obtained by one of by IPVM, one of the um, organizations that has done some important research into China's secret surveillance capabilities. The requirements of face facial recognition was gender identification, age recognition, but then also ethnic recognition, ethnic. That means the camera itself, the security camera itself detects, here is a Uyghur walking, crossing the street. And then you immediately connect that with the computer and you, you pull up the data, okay, what do we know about this Uyghur who's walking down the street? One of the key implementers of Beijing's new hardened strategy under Xi Jinping is Chen Quanguo, Beijing's strongman, first in Tibet for five years, and then in Xinjiang. Now, of course, we see a major difference between Tibet. There was a lot of talk about Tibetans and Tibet for many years and the oppressions that we saw there, but something different happened in Xinjiang. What happened in Xinjiang among the Uyghurs? Well, nobody really knew. Suddenly there were reports. Nobody was informed about this. There was a secret campaign of mass internment that was gathering steam and that was slowly being uncovered, including through my own work. Looking a bit like this. This is from a German, German media, German national television, driving, this was taken with a telezoom lens, driving from a taxi, driving in a taxi past one of those camps. In, in, in those days, I think this was probably early 2018, news organizations were still able to tell a taxi driver to go down a certain street and they would do it and they could take a picture. And pretty soon after that, those roads were closed off. It was no longer possible. So what even is going on or what even is re-education? And of course here our understanding also of communism becomes very important because communism really preaches a message of transforming people. Of course it's about trying to establish a more egalitarian society, but uh, allegedly. But what it does is ultimately it tries to change people. So the ability to change or reform people, if somebody doesn't submit and is not willing to be part of a new socialist experiment and a society led by the Communist Party, they will be subjected to reform through labor. And the Mao Zedong instituted in the 1950s, 
China's infamous national re-education through labor system was officially abolished in 2013. So how could they then uh, set up a whole network of re-education camps in Xinjiang? Well, the answer to that is that China's system of re-education has become refined. The reason why re-education through labor became abolished is it's a so-called administrative detention system, meaning you don't need legal proceedings to be sentenced to re-education through labor. Your local police station can say, oh, this person is lazy or this person is causing problem or he's, he's a petitioner trying to petition to the government in Beijing or something, or he's not following government policy, he or she. Um, so they can simply send somebody to re-education through labor. It's a so-called extra-legal system. And when Beijing was facing the Falun Gong in the 90s and 2000s, it seems to me that for the first time they were faced with a group that really didn't want to change, that really didn't want to work. And obviously, as you know, the Soviet gulag you know, was terribly ineffective. It didn't re-educate anybody. It basically brutally and ruthlessly tried to, tried to exploit people through labor, e exploit people's labor. And the Chinese Lao Gai and Lao Jiao systems essentially did the same. <laughs> they were used in the 50s and 60s to promote industrial growth. To, to, uh, it was like free labor for the government. And the re-education component that was supposedly transform people through labor was largely neglected. Now, when you have a problem like the Falun Gong and you actually, by that time, China's economic development was doing really well, they didn't need the prison labor. In fact, I don't know if you knew it, but one of the reasons why the gulags were closed down after Stalin died, or at least mostly closed down, I suppose, <clears throat> is because they were terribly ineffective. The productivity of gulag work was less than half of that of the Soviet regular enterprise, which already wasn't that high. So back in, those, in the early 2000s, the Chinese didn't need labor for, for, for economic development. They needed to change population groups that were not submitting to the CCP's rule. So in the text that you look, if you look at transformation through education, transformation through labor, re-education through labor. In those days, the CCP was really aiming to develop a new form of, or a, an effective form of re-education, forcing people to change their mind through brutal brainwashing in dedicated facilities. And this was called transformation through education, jiao yu zhuan hua in Chinese. Now, this method developed to crack the hard nut of the Falun Gong these brutal brainwashing methods in those, in those prison, in the prison camps, the Lao Jiao prison camps, these methods were applied to the Muslims in Xinjiang, upscale to change an entire group. And as you have seen before, there's 11 to 12 million Uyghurs, and they're targeting other Muslim groups too. So it's about 15 million. How do you change 15 million people? So one of the reasons why we speak about this unique development and experiment in Xinjiang is because the Chinese Communist Party is trying something. It's not been done before. I'm not sure any government in the world ever, anywhere, has subjected an entire huge ethnic group to a forced change and a forced assimilation in that sense without just shooting them. Now, I'm now moving a little bit into one of my specialties, of course, which is research methodology. So how do you uncover an atrocity of that scale, an atrocity of that nature, an atrocity that's hidden from public sight? You know, the, the digital information control on the Uyghurs was unprecedented. Uyghurs could not just tell people abroad, oh, openly what was going on. Sometimes they used code in their communication and said, oh, my aunt is at the hospital, which means my aunt's in a camp. So the sources <clears throat> I had been working on for several years to look at teacher, a little anecdote is I came across police recruitment by complete coincidence. I was not researching security and police. 
my PhD was in anthropology and I was researching minority education. And I was looking at teacher recruitment to understand the development of minority education. What kind of teachers are they recruiting? What are the recruitment requirements for teachers in the Tibetan ethnic minority system? And then I did a whole overview of all public recruitment. And within that I noticed they're recruiting more and more for the police and the police forces. So that became an interesting thing of itself and that's how some of this developed. So you have public recruitment notices, you have official reports, you have public bids. And at that time, in 2017 and 18, one of the most important pieces of evidence we had were these public procurement bids and construction bids with facility description. And then visual evidence to match it. So let's, let's do a concrete example. So you have a re-education camp in Conasher, Shufu County, Keshko. You have a construction notice. Here, the construction notice gives a location. This road, this place, we need a training center. That's how they were called. And oftentimes these construction bits also gave details such as we need, this is a vocational training school. It needs to have watchtowers, a police station, barbed wire, we need security equipment, security cameras, and an outer perimeter wall. And destruction proof doors. And here you can match this with the satellite. This is the road. Here's a former existing detention center. We'll zoom in now. And you have a date. So on satellite, Google satellite, you can scroll through images so we have this satellite image from May 26, 2017, right when the campaign was starting, and they were starting to build it. And then by November 2017, the facility was completed in accordance with the construction bid, basically. If you zoom in, you see high security fences that surround every so every building, every little thing, the courtyards are separated. These are fences. They are topped with razor wire at the top. And, and um, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but this having these really high fences and cordoning off a, a sort of a courtyard with high fences, uh, that's something that you see, for example, so at Guantanamo, Guantanamo Bay, the American facility in Guantanamo. You have a very correct, correct, characteristic new type of watchtower. So detention, detention center watchtowers were circular and round, and they were often beige or red. For these new re-education camps, they had blue square watchtowers. See them here, here you see the, the fences even better on this image, I think. And many of these were looked exact, they were like blueprints. They, just pumped them out of the ground, these, these facilities. They looked all the, many of them looked the same. Then at the entrance, you have a police station. This is actually the facility that we have. So this is for, this is material from, this is my research from early 2018. Now, zooming ahead, uh, at the beginning of this year, I was given a huge cache of internal files, the Xinjiang police files from hacked, obtained from inside Xinjiang police computers. And among them were detailed instructions of how to guard this camp. This camp. It had, it said which police for which, for which buildings, what weapons do they have, you know, what they use, machine guns and sniper rifles in the watchtowers. They have a police station, dedicated police station with armed police. How do they guard it? What, what happens? Exact procedure. So somebody tries to escape, what happens? One, two, three, four, five, six. So we couldn't imagine that, but now we even have that evidence. Back then we did not. Back then we had procurement bits, we had satellite, we had government reports, we had... The evidence was getting better and better. Similar patterns, you see in other places here, a legal system transformation through education school and vocational training center and 90% of the success of this research 
You know what the you, you know what the foundation for the success of this research is? And for finding this evidence? This evidence is publicly available at that time. Anybody could go on the Chinese internet and search it, but nobody did. The success was terminology, the right terminology, the right keyword. What is the right term for re-education? What are these things called? Because they're not called prisons, they're not called even camp. Terminology and policy framework, understand. What is the state doing and what is the state calling what it's doing? The combination of policy and the terminology that describes the policy in its execution. Here, you even had the square meters, <clears throat> 82,000 square meters for the whole site. And often they were built next to existing detention facilities, so it's more convenient for the police. Here again, this was prior to the construction bit in June. You look at an empty field. By October, the buildings were going up, the big courtyard in the middle, and by April 2018, it was finished. You see, it's right. This is a regular detention center, which has a certain type of building structure. You have the classic watchtowers, and you have the re-education camp watchtowers, police station, etc. Now, this is another facility, and for the comparison, I put the Alcatraz Federal Penitentiary, Penitentiary in San Francisco here. For size, this is about the same scale. This is quite a bit bigger. You can see those buildings. That was in April 2018. Some of these have capacity for tens of thousands of detainees. You can put tens of thousands of people in there. And then look, expansion, one year and one month later, all of the red, all of the buildings surrounded by red were added, or were additions, newly built, massive expansion, massive expansion, internment, and then a whole factory park, and then we had the topic of forced labor. You know, in 2018, one year after the internment campaign started, policy documents, official policy documents came out about how to handle internment labor. I've mentioned the Xinjiang police files. They were internal files obtained directly from Xinjiang police computer through hacking, published in May by myself, the victims of communism, and a consortium of 14 media outlets, including the BBC, and uh, Japanese national television, USA Today here in the US, um, major leading magazines and national television stations in Europe, showing one of the exercises, basically. And one of the details I can mention, for example, these images, they have metadata. So they have the camera serial number, the serial number of the digital SLR, the name of the camera, the lens, what lens, the serial number of the lens, the exact time down to the millisecond when the image was taken. So you can see, for example, one sequence of arresting a detainee who's trying to ride or escape. These are exercises, I'm sure. To putting them in a tiger chair for interrogation, tiger chair like torture devices took four minutes. They were done in four minutes. Another very important piece of evidence, internal speeches. So what is the scale of the mass internments? And you may have heard some numbers about how many million might have been in the camps. And of course, there were different estimates based on uh, satellite images, uh, estimates based on some of the internal some of the, uh, I mean, uh, documents. Back then, I came out with some estimates. But part of the Xinjiang police files is we had a whole bunch of spreadsheets, and we had a classified internal speech by China's Minister for Public Security, Zhao Keji, who was retired one month after we published this. He was supposed to be retired later this year, but 
I don't know if they retired him early to avoid sanctions. I don't know. But he, he was unexpectedly retired one month after we published his secret speech. Maybe he became too hot a potato. So anyway, talking policy impact of research. Zhao Keju in the speech, extremely compromising speech. So, so often in this research, you had to make inferences. You had to surround a topic from many angles. You had to look at this type of data, this source of data, these reports, these budget numbers, satellite images, whatever you could get, maybe some witness testimony, to make inferences about a certain atrocity or problem. But sometimes you just get it directly from the horse's mouth. And in this case, this was one of those cases. He said, Beijing will support mass internments with funding for prison construction, police guards, etc., saying everything's going well, but you've got to keep going. This was in June 2018, and he said, you've got to keep going. And he also revealed, basically, Beijing's secret plan, five-year plan. They had a five-year plan for suppressing Xinjiang, and it started in 2017 and ended in 2021, end of 2021. And at the end of 2021, what happened? Chen Quan Guo, party secretary, was retired and replaced with a successor with experience in economic development. So the five-year plan was completed successfully. Yeah. Other aspects of this atrocity, I'm just kind of taking you through different aspects of the atrocity. It's a lot of information, but just so you get a bit of a picture of what's all happening, and then we wrap it up. Intergenerational separation, that's a big word. Intergenerational separation, of course, I've already told you about a communist strategy to change people. And if you have been listening to your lectures at this institution, I'm sure at some point you have been heard, you have been told that one big aspect of communist regimes is propaganda and education. Propaganda and education. But rarely has it been done at this extent that you separate parents from children at such an early age into boarding schools. And these this statistics show preschool enrollment increased by region. So national is China. So between 2015 and 18, China increased preschool enrollment by 8%. And between 2012 and 18, if you take a bigger span, it's 20%. Now in Western China, you have higher percentages because um, it was being rolled out later. These regions are not as developed. And in some ways, it's natural. Preschool education in most countries is voluntary, is not mandatory. But in China, it's becoming mandatory because they want to have those young kids. They want to have the kids before primary school age. And preschool is three years, two to three years. But in Xinjiang, yeah, the percentages are a little bit higher. And if you go to Xinjiang's ethnic Uyghur regions. This was done military style by Chen Chuenguo. He said at the same time as the camps were stamped out of the ground, everybody into preschool. And it doesn't matter. So if both parents are in a camp, that's fine because there's a school to take care of kids. And they can't even sleep there. Now, school security was increased in all of China because of attacks or whatnot. But have you ever seen a primary school that looks like this? You have an anti-vehicle barrier. You have an anti-truck concrete barrier. Uh, this thing might possibly even stop a tank. I'm not sure you could roll through this with a tank. Barbed wire, razor wire, security cameras. And I saw a construction bid for a securitizing a kindergarten in a Uyghur region, and the company was uh, explaining how they were doing it. The Chinese company said, you know, we're doing a proper job. We have a three-level perimeter defense, including um, electric wire, high-voltage electric wires and cameras and a computer alarm system. So nobody can go and take their kids out, so to speak. This is the level of what we see in China. This is the level of what we see. Forced labor. 
The so-called vocational training education centers or re-education camps were sending those who had graduated with enough points who had their re-education was successful and they had passed the brainwashing test, they would be released into forced labor. But at the same time, the region had a second forced labor system that affected people who were not interned in camps. Because if you look at it, only between maybe 10, only about 10 to 15 percent of the adult population was put into re-education camps. So what about the rest? So the rest was living in an open air police state. And many of them are farmers and pastoralists and live in commu rural communities. Uyghurs are predominantly rural communities. And the state, starting in 2014, Xi Jinping gave a speech, a classified top secret speech, which we were leaked and given last year. And in the speech, he basically says, unemployed are a threat. Those who are not busy working, those who are idle, they are a threat, a national security threat, because they can get radicalized, they can listen, they have time on their hands, they can listen to extremist ideology and rise up against the state. So China's strategy, and this is not only in Xinjiang, but we also see it in other regions, including Tibet, What do you do? You change everybody's lifestyle. So you have a traditional rural community where people are farming their land. And yes, some of them want other jobs. And yes, some of them want vocational training. And yes, some of them want to move to the big city. But many don't because they're used to their lifestyle and they have their, they have their mosque and their institution. Here, the training, hundreds of thousands, millions, so this, the forced labor scheme through labor training is bigger than the camps. It's bigger than the forced labor system through the camps. An estimated two to two and a half million persons in Xinjiang are at risk of forced labor. And the bigger system is this one, which is not linked to the camps. It's scooping up hundreds of thousands of villagers, subjecting them to close centralized training. You know, we saw a little bit what that looks like, right? They have, they have includes military drill and they learn to obey the party and they learn to swear, and here you see them. This is after their vocational training, and they're about to be all shipped to the same factory, wearing the same uniform. They're gonna be, the police puts them on a bus, and at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the destination, they, they get received. There's no, there's no escaping from this. And they're swearing the oath to the Communist Party. That's, that's what that is. The oath of allegiance to the Communist Party. And the ladies, too, lined up, boarding the train, and they're going far away from their home, far away from their community. Again, you have parent-child separation going on here. You have parents, your fathers being shipped off to a factory park a thousand miles to the north, or in another province, you have young women shipped off. And to make sure, that everybody works. Of course, what you do, sometimes you have like women behind who have very young children, too young for primary school, too young for boarding school. So to get those women into work, you have satellite factories that are small little workshops in a village. Every village gets its own little satellite factory or almost every village. They have nurseries. So you have an infant. Infant stays at the factory nursery while the woman works and then in the evening can pick up the baby and go back home. Centralized state childcare, centralized elderly care. So there's no excuse not to work. And in 2021, it's interesting, things have seemed to become a little calmed down. They're not as intense anymore in Xinjiang and people have been released from camps into forced labor, but, the full empl but in 2021, Xinjiang increased its employment requirement from at least one person per household has to work in a factory or something that's off-farm labor to full employment requirement. Every able-bodied person of working age is supposed to work. And of course, this also 
Xinjiang is a very expensive police state. It's not cheap to run camps, prisons, and all this security. And Uyghur labor is considerably cheaper than Han Chinese labor in East China, which has gotten a lot more expensive. So this is, um, you can kill several birds with one stone. This is far more effective than a gulag, which had a very low productivity because people are sent to Chinese companies who get subsidies, and Chinese companies are very effective at making their workers hard, uh, work hard. Chinese, Chinese labor, private, Chinese private enterprise labor has a high productivity, much higher than prison labor. But this kind of labor often is not entirely, sometimes it's, it's, it's on a scale. Some of it is almost the same as prison labor and some of it is a little bit better, but there's no way to tell if somebody's doing it voluntarily or not. So you have a very similar system in Tibet in 2019. China published a policy of military drill, vocational skills training for labor transfer in Tibetan regions. And in 2020, the year when Xi Jinping had his signature initiative to eradicate poverty, they proudly announced the training and transfer of 600,000 Tibetan nomads and farm, mostly nomads, some farmers, in, by the end of 2020. And you have to understand that China is very proud of having allegedly claimed, they claim to have eradicated absolute poverty. I mean, of course, if you scoop up a couple million people and march them into factories, there's a good possibility that you would have eradicated some absolute poverty because even if they get paid very poorly, they, would be, they do get paid above the absolute poverty line, which is extremely low, which is a 4,000 Chinese, the, uh, the absolute poverty line is 4,000 Chinese yuan per year income, per capita income, which is, I think it's by, divided by six, now by seven, the Chinese yuan is weakening. So that's like about um, five, six, 600 US dollars per year income. That's a poverty line. If you earn more than that, you are, you're not poor, absolutely speaking. So you, if somebody could still earn a pittance, in effect, working long hours in a factory and be, uh, be alleviated from poverty. And of course, China's very proud of this and tells other, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't advance this slide. <clears throat> and of course, China's very proud of this model. So these are the Tibetans. See, Tibetan script, Chinese script, the mountains in the Tibet Autonomous Region. So the Chinese are very proud of this model and are telling other developing countries, look, we have eradicated absolute poverty and that's how we did it. We have a model for the world. We have our own model. And this is, you know, did you know at the United Nations, the Chinese are redefining human rights. There's a big movement that of China redefining human rights at the United Nations. And they got a bunch of countries joining in with them and they say, the Western individualistic American definition of human rights is that individual people have certain rights to certain political rights. But we Chinese, we go our own way. They portray this, of course, as cultural Chinese. You know, it's, it's really communist, but yeah. We Chinese, we've gone our own way. And for us, we're not such an individualist American society. You know, we, for us, a human right is the right of a society to economic development and to live a good life. How can you have human rights if somebody lives in poverty or inequality? Like in America, the beggars on the streets, you know, that's not human rights. So they're redefining human rights at the United Nations and this is part of it. In January 2021, in its last days, the Trump administration banned the import of cotton from Xinjiang following my research on forced labor in cotton picking that I published in December late December that year. And one of the images in my research report that led to the, this US policy is this image. Might seem like an unremarkable image accompanying a government report, propaganda report. If you look at this image, so these are the government officials and these are the people lined up for the bus to go and pick cotton. 
Now, you need to know picking cotton is back-breaking work, incredibly hard work done, you know, Xinjiang is very hot. Uh, it's, it's in the heat. It's very, very hard work. Now, are these people who would normally pick cotton? These are elderly people. I think just about every one of them is 50 plus, 60 plus. Some look like they're 75. Those people don't pick cotton. But what was, what was going on in 2017? This is a report from 2017. In 2017, Xinjiang had a problem with the cotton harvest. What's the problem? Millions of young, able-bodied men are where? In a camp, in the re-education camps. One to two million people, many of them younger or middle-aged, are in re-education camps and cannot pick cotton. So they were going to the villages and rounding up literally everybody who was left and sent them to the fields to pick cotton so we can wear nice, comfortable socks and underwear and whatnot here, here in America, because we import. Xinjiang produces 22% of the world's cotton. I'd be extremely surprised if any of you did not have a clothing item in your closet that was not made at least in part of cotton from Xinjiang. That would be very surprising. So, should I take questions at the end? Not in between, right? We just, I just keep going? Okay, unless there's some real understanding questions. It's not too much more, but it does get more and more progressively depressing. Now comes the worst topic, and then we finish. Then we can all have a coffee or a stronger drink. <laughs> no, it's not the most pleasant research topic. It really isn't. So government data also showed another disturbing trend among the population, sterilizations. And this was just published in a national statistical yearbook, just a mundane statistic. Table 8A2, nothing special about it. Just sitting around in the yearbooks. And that's blue is the China. And of course, they abolished the one child policy. And then you, of course, had a significant decrease in sterilizations in 2016. But in Xinjiang, the opposite happened. And in two weaker counties, they, have, they published very detailed family planning and population targets. And one of the targets was to sterilize uh, several thousand women of childbearing age. And you can calculate what percentage that is based on the female population. Birth rates declined dramatically. And of course, they, dec they declined much faster in Xinjiang as a whole, 24%. Oh, down there. Xinjiang as a whole compared to national. China has had declining birth rates, but 4% is not as much as 24%. And then the Han Chinese counties in Xinjiang, they had a 20% decline. But the ethnic minority counties, they had a pretty <coughs> dramatic decline. So. Based on this data, which I published in July, June, July 2020, the Pompeo State Department, the, the administration, uh, declared that the situation in Xinjiang was a genocide. Because birth prevention, preventing a group from bearing children is one of the five potential possible indicators of, in the 1948 Genocide Convention. There's one problem, though, and the Trump administration back then made an inference um, because with genocide, you also have to demonstrate intent. What is the in you have to demonstrate that there's an intent to destroy an ethnic group in whole or in part through one of these five measures, which are killing people outright, separating parents from children permanently, um, birth prevention, and so on. Mental harm, 
Um, what is the intent? So we have, a, we have a fact. We have a fact of declining birth rates. We have a fact of sterilization. We have policy evidence. But what is the wider intent behind it? Typically, a genocidal regime rarely advertises their genocide mission statement, right? And in the Xinjiang context, it is complicated because ultimately the goal is not to kill Uyghurs. We don't have death camps. The goal is to forcibly integrate them and birth prevention is one part of that. Now, digging around a bit deeper, another source, an important source for my research in 2021 became Chinese academic research papers, which are freely available, thank God, on the Chinese academic database. And they brought a bunch of inspiration statements made by important academics, and these academics typically are so-called uh, cadre scholars, meaning they're also government officials or they directly feed into government or there's a very strong relationship between academia and government. Um, so one of the important academics in Xinjiang said in 2015, Xinjiang must change the population structure and layout, ending the dominance of the Uyghur ethnic group. How do you end the dominance of a weaker ethnic group in terms of population structure? Well, you have to, the, the problem is by 2015, between 2005 and 2015, Uyghurs were growing at the highest rate of any ethnic group in China. Of course, much faster than the Han, but also high. Uyghurs were multiplying. The Uyghur population was growing faster than Han Chinese population. The highest official with a statement like this, Liu Elei, Deputy, Deputy Secretary General of the Party Committee of one of the um, entities in Xinjiang said, the problem in Southern Xinjiang, which is the Uyghur heartland, or the Uyghurs are, most Uyghurs live in Southern Xinjiang, is mainly the unbalanced population structure. Population proportion and population security are important foundations for long-term peace and stability. The proportion of the Han population in southern Xinjiang is too low, less than 15%. The problem of demographic imbalance is southern Xinjiang's core issue. Now, he did not say that in 2015. He did not even say that in 2017. He didn't say it in 2018. He said it in July 2020. This was a time when already some people, a bunch of people were, had been released from re-education re camps, either some were sentenced to long prison terms or forced labor, things were already moving on. China was, had already invited journalists even to see some of the camps. So he says, this is the biggest problem that Xinjiang has not yet addressed in July 2020. So we are talking a long-term plan here. He said, Xinjiang must afresh analyze its population structure and ethnic structure from a viewpoint of national security. And that means you can't have, and if, I have a whole research paper on this, you can't have too many Uyghurs all in one place. They need to be dispersed through labor transfer, but the main thing is you gotta bring Han Chinese in and you gotta cut down that Uyghur population growth. We can't have all these Uyghurs. Now, if you dig deeper, a 2017 research paper published by two researchers from the Xinjiang Police Academy on population, government funded research, they were telling us a bit more directly what that really means. They are saying, to completely eradicate terrorist crimes in Xinjiang, basically resistance against the government, it is necessary to completely eradicate the soil, the growth conditions, and the environment in which terrorist mobs produce crimes. To do so, it is necessary to rationalize the population structure, meaning optimizing the proportions of the population. 
So you have different types of populations, they basically say, and the, the ratio between these need to be optimized. So you have, and that is to solve the human problem is the foundation of solving Xinjiang's counterterrorism and other problems, meaning national security problems. Embedding the population is one of the simplest and most direct ways to solve the human problem. So you bring in some other populations and mix them up. This will achieve the goal of diluting the proportion of the poor population because they're considered to be more problematic. We already had the topic of forced labor. The proportion of the unemployed, we already had that. The proportion of the low educated, the proportion of certain ethnic populations, they don't say directly, but of course we know who's, what that refers to, meaning you have to dilute the Uyghurs, the proportion of the population with a criminal history and so on. So that's a population, the, the strategy for population security. And Xi Jinping said some interesting things about optimizing the ethnic population structure in his top secret speech in 2014. So, this is my last slide. <clears throat> we are seeing that the Chinese Communist Party is seeking increasing control over the entire population. And when we look at what they're doing in Xinjiang, of course, that's only one region and that's only one ethnic group. But whatever happens in Xinjiang and has happened there really explains a lot and tells us a lot about who the Chinese Communist Party is, how they, what they're willing to do, what their goals are, etc. In my opinion, what's happening in Xinjiang is, is really a window into the soul of the CCP and for understanding them also in relation to us and for the whole, and also what they're doing with the Chinese because some of the things that happen in Xinjiang are happening in other parts of China too. Targeted re-education is already used against pockets of resistance. Comprehensive surveillance apparatus with facial recognition is, has been extended everywhere, not just in Xinjiang. Full information about movement and employment status, so making sure everybody's aligned, that's also being pushed in other ethnic regions and all of these measures have been drastically further enhanced through the COVID measures. And of course, people are speculating that one of the reasons that Xi Jinping continues to pursue a zero COVID strategy is because of the incredible leverage of social control that he can achieve by maintaining these measures. Thank you for listening for 63 minutes and I will answer, gladly answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Zenz. Can we give him a round of applause? We'll take about five minutes for questions. So if anybody has one, I'll bring the mic to you. Dr. Zenz. Thank, thank you, Dr. Zenz. I wanted to ask you what Beijing's policies are on internal travel. In the old Soviet Union, you could not travel from one town to another without having some four, five, six documents in order, an internal passport, uh, a trade union card, your draft card, a residence card, and all of that sort of thing. Uh, it was extremely difficult to do that, and you couldn't get, you couldn't move to another town unless you had a job, and you couldn't get a job unless you had a residence, and you couldn't get a residence unless you had a job. To what extent does any of this pertain in China today, or at least in some regions of it? Thank you, indeed. So, <clears throat> the population registration system was a system placed, was the basic strategy for industrialization under Stalin. The Stalinist industrialization strategy was to keep the majority of the rural population in the countryside in poverty, producing cheap food and sustenance for the industrial urban population to promote basically fueling, fueling inexpensive industrialization. 
you couldn't have all these people move to the city. You know, it, there, wasn't, there weren't enough jobs and, and the, the state didn't want to take care of them. They had to take care of themselves. In the countryside, you know, if there's five people in a family or 10, they'll all survive because they're producing their own food. They'll just be poor. And the same system of the hukou system of, of residents, and, and you could not move to the city and get a job there, um, or easily to any other place or county for that matter. Uh, the hukou system was designed and put in place by Mao Zedong for that exact same reason. And in the 1980s, under Deng Xiaoping, the Chinese realized that they had this huge pool of rural surplus labor that was extremely unproductive and was a ticking time bomb in modernity. And that's why you have these hundreds of millions of Chinese, the internal migrants. They were now allowed not to formally register, not to get any social benefits in a city, but they could leave and take up work on their own in the 1980s. And that revolutionized, of course, that fueled China's industrial growth into an export nation through cheap labor. And this very development was not fully accepted by some ethnic groups, such as Tibetans and Uyghurs, who didn't want to leave their communities, who didn't want to. Some of them did, but not all of them. And that's why you have these forced labor transfers. They actually, they effectively enforce. They do the opposite. Before they were locked in a place, and now they can't stay in the place. Um, but China, of course, at the moment, imposes great restrictions through COVID uh, on movement. The hukou system is not entirely abolished, or was not entirely abolished, to make sure that these migrants couldn't get benefits. They couldn't necessarily go to school. They shouldn't bring their kids. They should just work and um, fuel the economy of the country. But now some cities are further relaxing the hukou requirement because they're quite in trouble at the moment with the economic growth. That's what I can say on that topic. So do you think this model is going to be sustainable for the future? Oh. Do you think this model will be sustainable for the future? <clears throat> So what happened in the late 2000s and 2010s is that the pool of cheap rural surplus labor uh, ended and that China uh, wages increased, started to increase because you started to actually run out of skilled labor and China also had a, a need to uh, have more skilled labor. And that's where the government quite intelligently, I guess in some ways, uh, steered a moving up on the, on the supply chain that China would become more sophisticated, not just producing plastic toys, but producing more and more sophisticated products and allowing labor costs to increase and to rise. And so they had sort of a strategy in place when the cheap rural surplus labor ended to then uh, promote an upgrading of the workforce. But the problem is the inequalities were not addressed that way because you had a huge amount of rural uh, labor that was still poorly educated and got poor wages and was still exploited and especially in among the Western minorities. So the, the solution to the end of cheap rural surplus labor was to move up the chain basically and China has done that with some success. So continual adaptation, you can never just rely on one model just like this country and Western countries so you just got to continue to adapt and China looked like they were going to adapt quite successfully and outmatch many of us Western countries, including on developing technology and other things. That was the trajectory. But the latest under Xi Jinping is now a turn to a Maoist uh, personality cult state with incredible social control and a crackdown on free entrepreneurial spirit which is currently considerably dampening that trajectory or changing that trajectory. Um, <clears throat> what other ethnic groups besides the Uyghurs and the Tibetans are in danger of uh, coming under the cultural control of the uh, Han Chinese uh, majority? Uh, basically any group that is not voluntarily assimilating or that's causing trouble because it's holding on to a strong identity. Any group that 
strongly says we are from here and this is actually kind of our land and we have our own language and we are the natives here and we're not giving this up. You know, we can take Chinese jobs and we can be part of China and we may not even need our independence, but we're not just gonna give up our identity of being the people of this place. Anybody like that is potentially threatened. And the next in line have been the Mongolians in Inner Mongolia. And uh, they have been, you know, because uh, the government, Chinese government has uh, promoted an increasingly assimilatory ethnic policy. So uh, reducing the ability of ethnic groups to learn in their own language. So in primary schools, secondary schools, education system, being Sinicized, promoting the Chinese language, reducing ethnic contents. And the Inner Mongolians were rising up and going on the streets against it. And that happened last year, and it was covered quite well in the press, actually. And um, the Chinese sent in their right police and everything, and now they're turning Mongolia to the next police state. And um, there are little ethnic groups like the E, the e people in Yunnan and some of those people who are not as keen to participate in the labor system and to shift out of into manufacturing from traditional agriculture and all that. And some of them are at risk of being subjected to coercive poverty elevation for sort of forms of forced labor effectively. Um, that's basically the situation. Or is it the issue that it can go on and it's not going to be because of the sheer massive size of the population of China in general? Right? And you could get a couple of million extra police security forces every week dispensed someplace else because of just the population of China. So if you just look at Xinjiang on the surface, it looks like there's been considerable success. So a lot of the camps have been closed and people are working in factories and police presence on the streets has been reduced. And some media outlets have even, like the Washington Post published a piece that I find extremely problematic actually. I mean, of course the media has been trying to cover this, but basically saying how the crackdown is ending and or shifting. Um, and in, of course it is, the crackdown is shifting. And the Chinese are very adept at making it look better. And on the surface, you know, the Uyghurs are compliant. Nobody dares to do or say anything there. Officially, there haven't been any terrorist attacks, which is possible, of course. We don't know. There's no independent coverage. And so on the surface, you say, hmm, they're sort of seeming to get, get away with this. There's some success in there. But I'm quite confident that the whole thing isn't going to work out not just in Xinjiang, but also in China, because look what, Ma, look what Xi Jinping is doing. He's going back to Mao, back to ideology. He's doing cultural re revolution style purges. Now that's not compatible with what we believe we know about human nature. So evil can run a course for some time, but there's been a tendency that it does run out at some point, even if it looks really strong at a point. And so my sense is that Xi Jinping is already heaping up, mis multiplying mistakes as we speak. He's already making plenty of enemies and creating a lot of unsustainable. Of course, what you do in Xinjiang, people are traumatized. You have not actually created a viable long-term solution in Xinjiang, have you? No, you have not. So actually, the, the long-term, you've just put a lid on a pot. So that would be kind of my comment on that. Because at the end of the day, history does teach us that the lies of communism, at the end of the day, it has never worked in history, and it's not sustainable. Because as you said, human nature is for us to be free. Correct. Mm -hmm. Correct. And that applies to communism, and that applies to other, other types of regimes who suppress freedom and lie, and lies generally don't last. So the truth tends to come out at some point. There you go. I would agree with you. <laughs> Take our last two questions, starting here and then go in the back. All right. Sorry, the young lady behind you was first. And Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to ask you about whether you see any sort of shift in the international response 
to this um, to the actions in Xinjiang. Um, I understand that the UN recently published a major report that was not necessarily expect, expected. Um, so I am wondering mm. if you see any sort of shift in the international community's response. Thank you. Yes, there has been considerable shift. I mean, it's 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 very very in, on many levels it's, it's it's very inadequate and way too slow. But if you compare the situation we have now and what governments are saying, you know, the German government statement after the Xinjiang police files, wow, that was like the first time they really said something. You know, I mean, you got to count that as an improvement. Uh, I mean, comparatively speaking, things have moved significantly, and of course, it took some time for the evidence to come out, and the evidence has to filter down, and somebody has to read it and have a hearing on it, and then people need to think about it. Um, so things have moved fairly slowly, but we're looking at a growing international response, and a report you mentioned, despite having some shortcomings, is helping, is helping with that, and there's a vote at the UN next week on a decision to have a discussion on a matter. Now, you might think a vote on a decision to have a discussion yeah. is very, very, very small progress for a terrible human rights atrocity. And the Uyghurs certainly think that. But it's a lot of progress over having nothing. One more question. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, do, do you think any kind of a change would happen in this policy after Xi Jinping enters his third term uh, until 2027. Okay. <clears throat> On Xinjiang specifically? Uh, yes. Probably not, because I think the change already happened when Chen Chuen Guo's five year plan was successfully executed. You know, year one mass internment, year two continue to crack down year three, stabilize, and by year five, complete stability. That was the, the five-year plan for Xinjiang. And in, at the end of 2021, Chen Chuen Guo was replaced by a new party secretary, Ma Xingrei from Guangdong, who's a technocrat experienced in economic development. His style is not high-handed you know, mass internment campaigns or highly visible mobilization like Chen Chuen Guo or police state, his strength is to make the whole police state sustainable and, and make that whole, with the forced labor, and make it long-term successful. So I think that strategy shift um, probably took place at the end of last year. Um, Xi Jinping's third term is bearing risks. If his rule is insecure, he could become more heavy-handed. If there's any resistance to his rule from Xinjiang, we would see a return of a very visible crackdown. We also have thousands languishing in prisons, especially intellectual figures. Um, if everything goes really well, if the dictator is in good shape and happy and the country, everything goes smoothly, then he has less reason to be tough-handed. That's how it tends to be. So that makes it less likely that there will be change overall, but it might make it easier for some of the people. But I think that transition already took place last year. Thank you. We'll give another round of a hand for Dr. Zenz. Thank you. I would like to thank Dr. Zenz again, and everybody for joining us uh, both here on campus and virtually through the live stream. Uh, if you are at all interested in attending any of our other upcoming events, making a gift to IWP, or applying to one of our many graduate programs, please visit us at iwp.edu or grab a staff member at the end. Thank you again, mm -hmm. and uh, hope to see you at the next lecture.